Good morning, everybody. And welcome to our Sunday morning service. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a different service today. We originally didn't even have a pianist, so we were going to look at doing all of the songs this morning a cappella. Um, however, Peter was asked if he could maybe play during the offertory, and he said, hey, I don't mind playing a few songs as well. So it's going to be a bit of a mix. We're doing a couple of songs a cappella, and we'll just get a starting note, and then just follow our lead in terms of timing. We'll, uh, we'll do our best to keep it from sinking down into the abyss, but just follow our lead and we'll be fine. It's all songs everybody knows. And for the rest of them, Peter has graciously offered to play along for us. So thank you very much. Um, Judith gave me one announcement for this morning, and that is there is a Monday Thursday service at Christ Community. It's at 6 o'clock. And they asked if you want to go, if you can RSVP with them, because it's going to be a dinner and a service combined. So, without further ado, could you please rise and join us in our opening song, Hosanna. And it is Palm Sunday, so we have a little bit of help with us this morning for this song. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord. Shibe coming to preach for us, and he is just going to come up and give us the opening blessing. Good morning to all of you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So now uh, pass God's greeting and extend it to one another. Thank you. Thy power throughout the universe. 
first displayed, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul. Great is thy faithfulness. 
day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you. We confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's, that our faith is often more show than substance, that our lives are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, son of David, savior of our lives. Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness.
now it's time for the children's craft table. So you guys can pick up your palm branches and head off to the back. After a hug goodbye, of course. I'm just going to say a quick prayer for the, these kids as they head off. Lord Jesus, please bless the time that these children are going to be spending at the table as they learn about you. Please open their hearts to know you and to hear you and to feel your presence. And we commit them to your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in congregational prayer. Everlasting God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us closer to you today. The days are getting brighter and longer. There are daffodils and crocuses blooming. It's at this time of year that more daylight and warmer weather reflect transition from darkness to light and new life. Similarly, God's timing and creative order represents the Easter message, Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the tomb. So we look forward to March break and Easter weekend, look forward to the longer days and emerging beauty and be reminded of God's provision and great love for us. We have already praised you in song because in you we find our heart's true home. To you we give all glory. You bore our flesh. You taught us radical love. You redeemed us from sin and shame. You chose us to wear your name in this world. We thank you for your abundant blessings. Thank you for all who have faithfully done their jobs this week. For those who cut hair, set bones, drove a bus, taught class, fixed a roof, manufactured useful goods, and installed a sink. All of these tasks, and many more, are important for the well-being of this world. Continue to be with those seeking employment. We commend them to you for blessing. We pray for those who need your help in a special way. We raise Reen Reedstra and pray that Hen Rowley and family may feel your presence at this difficult time. Remember John Rutenbeek as he continues to deal with health challenges. Bless Dave Kroll in his struggles as well. Rehabilitate and heal Joan Shasma. Grant your comfort and peace to all those who are ill. We commend Bill DeWall to you as well as he just heard word this week that his sister passed away suddenly in Calgary. Bless them as they cut short their vacation and arrange a funeral. We pray for those who are lonely and ask that you touch the hearts of church members that feel far from you. We pray for a blessing too on all the activities that our church hosts during this holy week. We thank you for leadership provided by council and pray for an extra measure of wisdom and compassion as they deal with many issues. The complicated issue of human sexuality and the search for a worship coordinator to just mention two. May the annual search for new office bearers go well. Thank you for the continued work of the deacons and we ask for a blessing on today's collection for the King's University, a Christian institute institution in Edmonton, Alberta. Redeeming Savior of the world, we, your followers, need you to guide us in the way, the truth, and the light today. Holy Spirit, hover close to our minds today as we listen to your word preached by Pastor Clark so that we can take it with us when we leave this place. 
Jesus, as we consider the cross in this Lenten season, the cross where you died, may we understand more deeply your sacrifice and receive abundantly your love as we become more aware of our own brokenness as well as the brokenness of the fallen world. Continue to remind us that Jesus is our great savior because of the cross. In the words of the famous hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, it's really good to be back here again. Uh, I've preached here probably about six times, but it has been back in the era uh, pre-COVID, uh, back in the old days. But uh, so it's been some time. Uh, I knew David and Brittany quite well, and I know some of you quite well. And so it's really good to see your faces. Uh, my name is Clark Scheibe. Uh, just before I get into the sermon proper, just tell you a little bit about myself if you're not too familiar. Uh, my wife, I have a, a wife and two kids, and, but I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Don't hold that against me. I married a Canadian girl. Uh, but I'm a part of a ministry called Labrie, and it's an international ministry that started in 1955 out of Switzerland. But there's, uh, don't let the word international think big. It's about 10 communities in different parts of the world. Uh, Korea, Australia, a couple in the States, England, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and uh, newly in Brazil and in South Africa. Well, we actually have one here on Vancouver Island, and we moved here in 2015, and that's how I met David, is I was asking him for just how, how life on Vancouver Island was, and the church life, and all this, uh, of all the churches and Christians on Vancouver Island, and was there a need for a community like Labrie, because we welcome people who are Christians, but we also welcome people into our home that are not Christians. Some, and then a lot of people who are just confused about where they stand because some kind of crisis has hit them. Uh, and so they're wondering, is Christianity true? And so what they do is that they, they're, they're short-term guests, half the day they work, half the day they study. And, uh, and so the chores are kind of like chopping wood, you know, dusting, <laughs> 
reorganizing the library. But the studies are personal, and so people come with you know, 18 to 81 years old. Uh, it was just last year we had an 18-year-old boy, Chinese boy come from a communist family. He was an atheist working alongside an 81-year-old woman from California who loved the Lord. Uh, and so they were cooking dinner together, and I was like, only at Labrie. Uh, but that's kind of our life. And so we have people coming around tables discussing, and then also on Friday nights we have a public event where we welcome people into our home and we give public talks. But there's a meal that precedes it, and so we do that almost every Friday. So I extend a warm welcome to all of you if you ever want to do that, or if you want to just get notices to see uh, what kind of topics we talk about. Talk about science, psychology, art, theology. So um, you're welcome to talk to me if you want. But, uh, but there you have it. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Mark chapter 1. Now, I realized it was Palm Sunday too late, so I'm sorry I don't have a Palm Sunday sermon, but maybe you're relieved by that. <laughs> I don't know. But, <clears throat> but we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45, a small story about Jesus healing a, a leper. Uh, but before I begin, I just want you to know that Mark begins in action. It doesn't start slow. There's no birth narrative. There's no buildup. It's just Jesus acting, and, and it's just act, act, event, 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 and it's very immediate. And he's, he's healing with power. He's teaching with power. He's exercising demons. And so the question is kind of, who is this man who comes out of the mist and with all this power over, over the demons, over sickness, and, um, and the authority to teach? Who is this man? And so that's what we need to think about. But you should also know one more thing before I read it, is that Jesus comes with all this power and all the crowds are gathering around him, confused as who he is, but he doesn't trust the crowds. Throughout all of Mark, the crowds almost plays its own character, its own role, and Jesus does not trust the hearts of men. He does not trust the crowds um, because they always want to take him to be something other than he is. And so that will play formatively throughout Mark and even in our passage. But let me read it, and then, uh, and then we'll dive more deeply into it. Starting with verse 40, chapter 1 of Mark. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Let me pray. Father, we need your wisdom. I thank you that you are a God who has not just created, but that you have spoken, and that you have spoken to your people over, um, since the beginning of time. But you have also um, encoded that in your scriptures so that we may even hear your voice now. And so we pray that you open up these scriptures into our heart, that we might see you, and that we might love you, and that we might obey you. So Lord, please speak. In Jesus' name, amen. So what you're going to see is that um, uh, this story is a wonderful account of Jesus' healing. The man is so overjoyed, he forgets that Jesus calls him to, uh, he forgets what Jesus has called him to do and runs to tell everyone of the miracle that just happened. You can't blame him. Uh, we may think that this is a story about how we are so overwhelmed with joy that we, when we are encountered and changed by Jesus, that we cannot help but run out and tell everyone of what Jesus has done. We see that happen with the Samaritan woman, the woman that Jesus encounters at the well. He tells her about the living waters and about him being the Messiah, and she's been so overwhelmed with shame, distant from the community, but when she encounters Jesus, 
She runs to the community she's avoided all this time just to tell them about Jesus. But this is not that kind of story. In fact, it ends on a sad note, and it's something that we need to pay attention to. It's sad because as we see in verse 45, Jesus could no longer enter the towns openly, and that he had to stay in lonely places. The man was separated from community, but Jesus has restored him. But as soon as he restores the man to community, it marginalizes Jesus. What's happening here? So the first thing I want us to see is that this is a desperate man. Okay, in verse 40 and 41, this is a desperate man who comes to Jesus. He comes and he falls on his knees and he cries out. Jesus has gained that reputation already and he's seeking that authority that maybe this, this man can cleanse me of the impossible. And so this man comes, raises his hands and says, can you make me clean? He's desperate. You should know that this man has been marginalized. He's been marginalized physically, socially, and legally. Physically, he has a skin disease. Now, he has to make this very obvious to everyone. He must wear dirty clothes. He has to have unkempt hair. You may not know it, but my hair is pretty unkempt right now. The few hairs are out of place. He has to put his hands up and cry out, unclean, unclean, wherever he goes. Um, he cannot try to hide his condition because he might contaminate others. He may make others unclean, so he has to make it very clear. Now, socially, he must stay away from people. He's isolated from community, from fellowship uh, with others. And he's able to come to the temple, but he has to stand behind a divider. And whenever he's walking around, he has to stay 50 paces away from clean people. And you thought COVID was tough. And it's been years and years for this man, it seems. But he also legally probably feels marginalized. Legally, he feels cursed by God that he has this disease this disease that would have implied God's curse on him. That his skin disease was a result of his sin. Now you can imagine how this must have eaten away at his will and his resolve and his worth day in, day out, night in, night out for years. But when he hears about Jesus, about what Jesus can do, it does not matter. He's beyond courage. He's desperate. He's desperate. He throws away the barriers and the conventions. He must get to Jesus. It does not matter what anyone else thinks. Now, I don't know if you've ever come to that place. You came to Jesus and you raised your hands and said, unclean, unclean. Can you make me clean? Are you willing? I remember when I did. I didn't have a skin disease. I did have a sin disease. I, I made, that was pretty good, right? Um, <clears throat> on the outside, everything looked good, but internally I was decaying. In my moment of desperation, I raised my empty hands and cried out, make me clean. And he did. He did. I was so excited and I was unashamed to tell anybody that I had come to Jesus. Now, one guy, uh, he was a famous photographer. I, this is when I was in Mississippi at university. And he said, do you really believe in Jesus? And I said, yes. He's like, then you're a bigger idiot than I thought. And I looked there and I thought, I pity you. Because I knew you couldn't make me clean. There's nobody could make me clean. He couldn't, my friends couldn't, my girlfriends couldn't. Only Jesus could make me clean. And when you know that, then you realize it doesn't matter. You despise the shame and you come to him. Just like the, uh, 
the woman who bled for years came to Jesus and he healed her just to touch his garment. The Samaritan woman at the well went back to her community that she had been avoiding and said, hey, this is my shameful story. And they're like, we know your shameful story. She goes, but not like Jesus does. Or the woman who came in and did not care that she, she wept on his dirty feet, wiped it with her hair, and kissed his feet. She did not care. When you come to Jesus, when you know that he can make you clean, you despise the shame. So that's why sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes were running to Jesus throughout all the gospel accounts. Only Jesus has the power to clean. Now, I imagine that this man may not have started out as desperate. He may have gone to the priests on several occasions when perhaps he was able to be cleansed. It says leprosy. It could have been some kind of skin disease. It does seem that it was leprosy. But maybe it, it had a buildup. Because according to the law, you could go to the priest when you were temporarily cleaned, and the priest could declare you clean. Okay, I declare you clean. Now you can go back to be with your friends, your family, make business deals, commune with people. And perhaps that was his hope. He tried olive oil. He tried aloe vera. Um, perhaps he traveled to the special waters of the pool of Bethesda. Probably he turned to anything or anyone who might offer a kind of solution to make himself presentable so that he might be declared clean. But if there were any solutions, it was short-lived. With Jesus, he knew something was different. Jesus had more authority. Jesus was superior to the law. The law could declare an external change. But Jesus could make an internal change. While the priest could declare him clean, Jesus could make him clean. Through the law, the clean can become unclean. But with Jesus, the unclean are made clean. So Jesus touches him and he is made clean. Now, when I feel guilty, because I do sin every day, uh, I like to clean my house. I like to clean my car and I get really tidy because uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> look for some topical solution. So if you ever come over to my house, it looks pretty messy. That means I'm, pretty, I'm doing pretty good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, it's pretty spotless right now. Um, but from time to time, in dealing with my sin disease, I look for short-term solutions. Perhaps I buy something or self-medicate through food or drink, diet, look for some financial security, political solutions. Whatever one might try to apply to their sin disease, none can transform its heart. An external change cannot bring about an internal transformation. Let me say that again. An external change cannot bring about an internal transformation. The man realized that everything outside of Jesus was a short-term solution, if any type of solution at all. But if we turn to Jesus, he can do what no one else can do, is cleanse us from within and transform us. So, as soon as this man's cleansed, what does he do? Well, he runs out and tells everyone about Jesus, about what Jesus did. The people began to come to him. So many people came they crowded around Jesus. But is that success? The story does not seem to see this as something so wonderful. It almost, just, it almost counters our expectations or presuppositions. Um, so it's ironic, as I said, that as Jesus restores him to community, Jesus is exiled from community, this exchange. Now, there's clues throughout the passage that this is not all that it should be. What I want you to notice is their harsh language throughout this whole passage. I didn't read it as harshly as I should have. Um, I read it as we typically would read it. But actually, there's lots of harsh language, and the English translation sometimes kind of softens it a bit. 
Now, it says here in this NIV version that he was filled with compassion. The ESV says moved with pity. But the, the earliest manuscript says that Jesus was filled with indignation. He was indignant. But it seems an odd saying, thing to say is that indignantly the man, Jesus healed the man. So it seem, And so I won't get into the whole history, but uh, it's this idea is that what's happening here? But there's this indignation that he has. And then you also see that he speaks to the man sternly, or here in the NIV it says a strong warning. Okay? Why does he do this? It also says that he sends the man to the priests. But actually the word is ekbalion. And ekbalion in Greek is when you exercise a demon. You're casting out demons. And so what it is, is Jesus is indignant in his healing. He sternly talks to the man and he casts him to the priest. That's, that's the movement that's happening in this story. So we don't get the picture of Jesus meek and mild here. Uh, it reminds me of a student that came to Labrie uh, on, when we were on Bowen Island. We moved from Bowen Island to Vancouver Island. And she was unchurched, totally unchurched. And she came around and she was always hesitant because on Bowen Island we were called the cult. <laughs> <coughs> it's not true. But uh, because we were Christians and we really believed it. That made us really crazy. Uh, but this woman would come around and then she would just, but she kept being attracted. And finally, uh, she said, I want to become a guest at your place. And I said, that's great. You know, spend some time with us rather than just coming over for tea. Well, then she backed out. Then she decided, no, I'm really going to do it this time. And she backed out. The third time she finally came. She was very nervous. And so she came in. We were having tea and um, cookies uh, during the day. And she walked in. She was like, Okay, I'm finally here, but Clark, I need to tell you something straight away. I hate Christians, but I like Jesus. And I said, I don't know who that is. And she said, Jesus, you know, Jesus, like maybe her pronunciation was wrong. And I said, I'm not sure if I know who you're talking about. And she's like, I thought this was a Christian place. And I said, Oh, wait, are you talking about the guy who wears the togas? He's really nice to kids. He says really smart things. She's like, yes, Jesus. And I was like, I don't know who that is. And she's like, I, I don't understand what's happening. And you probably don't understand what's happening. right? Now. And I said, here's the gospel according to Mark. I want you to read it, and you read it, and then come back to me next week, and we'll talk about it. Because she had never read the Bible before. And so she started reading, and she came back the next day. And she said, Jesus is a real jerk. And I was like, ah, we might be talking about the same guy. Because he is a confusing person. Uh, and so this idea is that we, we almost want him to be very soft. But we have to understand that he does not trust the crowds. He doesn't trust this man. right? Uh, and so he heals with compassion for sure, but it's also he's indignant. He's indignant because this, he's angry that this man has been ravaged by the effects of sin and evil. He distrusts the crowds, and so he's stern. He tells the man, go to the priest, and he casts him um, because he doubts the man's going to do it. The man will receive the cleansing from Jesus, but he fails to do what Jesus sternly commands. There's a second reason why we think, should see that this story is tragic. We must ask, why is Jesus sending him to the priest? He does not always send people to the priest when he heals, or at least we don't always um, have that in the accounts. Um, what he does want is he wants to send them to the priest as a testimony to them, as a proof to them in some translations. But a proof of what? A testimony to what? For whom? This is a proof that God is fulfilling his promises. 
In Jesus, God is fulfilling his long promises. So the law exposed sin. The law could declare someone clean temporarily, but the law could not forgive. The law could not transform. It could not make us clean. And because of those limitations, the law held out a promise. The law pointed to a time when God would do a new work. Move us from a law of stone or a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. It would be written on our hearts, and we would remove we would move from an external structure into an internal transformation. This promised spirit. And one piece of evidence that God was fulfilling those promises is that um, in some Jewish texts it said one of the evidences that the Messiah would come and heal leprosy. Now you should realize that the, Jew, uh, the, the rabbis thought that healing leprosy, uh, leprosy was as likely as resurrection, raising the dead. It was impossible. It's only something that God could do. And so Jesus is wanting this healed man to be a witness to the priests themselves to know that God is doing a new work, a new work of God fulfilling in Jesus right here, right now. So, by neglecting Jesus' command to go to the priest, the man denies the very evidence that God is demonstrating in Jesus. The man does not become a witness that Jesus called him to be. Instead, the man made people excited about what Jesus can do, but not about who he is. One scholar said, proximity and enthusiasm toward Jesus should not be equated with faith. So you can be really close to Jesus all the time and around Christian community all the time, and you can be very excited about it all, but don't be confused as if that is faithfulness, as if that is true faith. So the man denies what God is doing in Jesus. So we can get excited. We can raise our hands in worship. We can turn up 106.5 FM. We can buy the new best-selling Christian books, and we can seek to make ourselves feel better. But when we're called to fully place our lives in Him as He desires, will we? Or will we be choked by the pleasures of the world? Will we give up when it becomes too demanding? This is why Jesus, throughout Mark's account, does not trust the crowds. And that's what this story is pointing to. So often we do the same as this leper. We want Jesus' cleansing, but we fail to be faithful witnesses to the new work God is doing in Jesus in the world. We may tell people about Jesus but is there evidence that God is doing a new work as demonstrated in our very lives, in every area? Can people see the gospel being demonstrated and proclaimed with how we use our money, with how we treat people at work, how we treat our family, how we raise our kids, how we are at school? Is there evidence that God is doing a new work in Jesus through us? Now, Jesus' command is not to present ourselves to the priests, but to abide in what Jesus has called us to do, namely to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Or as Paul says, if we are buried with Jesus, we will be raised in his power, in the newness of life. This is the testimony Jesus has called us to make with our lives. Um, And so this is because abiding in this pattern that we are transformed into his likeness. Um, that God, when we lay our life and deny ourselves, he raises us up and produces his fruit through us, that fruit of patience, peace, goodness. And I was going through these today, and I always forget one, self-control. That's the one I always forget about, and I need God's work in me. But it's by God producing his fruit in our lives that we have a testimony that God is really doing a new work through Jesus. And how beautiful it would be for people to enter into our midst, into our personal lives or in our gathered lives, and to say, something is different here. There's patience, peace, goodness. There's a reality. God must be doing something. There must be a God. Now, 
I'll call him John. John is a guy that has come around Labrie a lot, and he was invited to one of the public talks that I mentioned to you earlier, and he was really nervous. He didn't want to come around Christians. He had had really bad experience growing up in Canada around Christians, but he came to Labrie and he just smoked cigarettes and paste out in the front. But finally, he heard that there was some food the next week or two weeks later, and then so he's like, okay, I'm going to come and get some food. And as soon as there was a talk, he left. And then he'd come, and then he got further and further in. Okay? And he started sitting and listening to the talks. He started uh, liking us. Uh, and, he's, and he's a very difficult person in many ways. He's also very likable. Um, now, sometimes he likes to come by and on my day off, and I'm just trying to catch a nap. Or maybe it's, the, or, it's the, or it's between events, and I'm just trying to catch a nap on my couch, and we have these big windows in our living room. And he likes to come up and just like look through our window. And he sees me laying there. He's like, oh, Clark looks peaceful. I wonder what he's going to do next. You know, It's, it's really kind of frustrating. Um, but what he's doing is he's wanting to know, is it really true? When the lights are off, Clark, and you're laying in your place, are you the same? Is God still doing a real work there? Is it really, really true? He doesn't want to say, oh, is it charisma? Is it intellectual? Is it humor? What he wants to know, can Jesus really do a new work in me? Or is it just another scam? another solution, something else to take out my money. He wants to know if he's all in, in every area of life, that if I lay my life down, will God really pick it up? Because it's a very scary thing to die to yourself, to, to give your life over to God. Will he really pick it up? And so he wants to look. He's looking in my life, and he wants to see every area of my life as a testimony to God doing a new work in me. Perhaps um, you have a John in your life, in your family or in your work. It's often true when people look at us, they want to know, is God doing a new work in the world through Jesus? Now, we can be thankful first that God can do this work with or without us anywhere, anytime, any place. And we can also be very thankful that we can confess that, yes, we have failed. But confession can also be a part of our faithful witness. It's not me just presenting something, but me really being able to trust God to pick it back up. And so we should confess so that we may be forgiven, which we are assured through Jesus. But this is where I want us to end, and this is what I want us to hold on to. Let us seek out Jesus' call on us to abide in him, and that the pattern he has set for us to, to lay down our life and to follow him, so that we are not just excited to tell people about Jesus, but to look to God to produce his fruit through us, so that the world may have a testimony that God, in fact, has done a new work in him. Amen. There we go. Hopefully my... Uh my compatriot is going to be coming back up here. But why don't you stand up and rise, and we're going to sing our song of response.
we're singing Hosanna, Peter. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you, we turn to you. receive God's benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Oh, 
Sunday, everybody.